beg of you. Let us go. Silence! You earned this when you defied Lady Marie! Be grateful that you get to contribute to the ceremony at all! Give us those tears of joy! Oh. Well, are you ready to join me for the rest of your lives? Hello there, welcome back to another episode of Arcade with Alvin. Today we'll be making Marie's wedding cake from the game Persona 5 Tactica. Now in the game, Marie is the villain with the only goal of having a wedding, a rather lavish one, and her wedding cake seems to be quite the feat. Now I've never made a wedding cake before, let alone a wedding cake from a video game. The great thing is we have friends in the studio that either know how to make wedding cakes or have friends that know how to make wedding cakes, so we'll be using their knowledge and pulling it together. So I'm thinking we go for a raspberry fruiting kind of wedding cake with not a lot of artificial flavors. First up is the batter for the cake itself. This is a quite interesting batter. It comes directly from a friend who actually makes wedding cakes for a living. The following amounts are going to get split into three. In a stand mixer goes in 13 and a half cups of cake flour, 12 cups of sugar, four tablespoons plus one teaspoon of baking powder, and one and a half tablespoons of kosher salt. The dry ingredients get to go hang around for a spin, and then in goes two and a quarter pounds of softened butter. What I've learned is this is called reverse creaming, where you first cream together the butter and the dry ingredients and then add the liquids at the end, whereas in some recipes you usually cream the butter and the sugar first. Once the butter and the dry ingredients have had a good time in there, we're going to add in our liquids. That's going to be 3 cups of vegetable oil and 1 cup and 2 tablespoons of buttermilk. While that goes for a spin, we're going to do 18 eggs and 27 egg yolks in another container, along with 2 cups and 2 tablespoons of buttermilk and 2 tablespoons of vanilla extract. Because our stand mixer isn't the massive one, we're going to have to do this in 3 batches. Once the batter is looking pretty good, I'm transferring this into a plastic container so that we can move on to the next batch. We're going to repeat this process two times, which brings us to three batches of cake batter. I was thinking about why this recipe is done this way, and what I was told was that by creaming the butter and the flour first, you're actually adding a little bit more structure to the cake itself, because wedding cakes do need to be eventually stacked and handled and transported. We're not sacrificing flavor, but we're adding a little bit of structure compared to our normal cake. However, that doesn't mean it's going to be a tough cake though. What's also great about this cake batter is that it's designed to be rested and held for many days at a time. I'm assuming when you're making wedding cakes for a living, you can't really bake and make cake batter on the same exact day, especially in large portions. So I'm also really curious to see how that turns out. Once all the batter is done, we're going to move these all into plastic containers that are airtight and move them into the fridge for tomorrow. It is now day two in the kitchen, and we have here 11 inch cake pans, 9 inch, 7 inch, and 5 inches. These are going to be the four tiers that eventually make up the wedding cake, and each one has a little cartouche made out of parchment paper, and a little bit of cooking spray to make the parchment paper stick to the bottom. After resting for a day, our cake batter is kind of like the texture from mashed potatoes. It's quite satisfying to spread. Kind of preferred over the liquid cake batter. For the 11 inch cake pan, because the cake is so large, we're going to insert a little baking nail that helps conduct heat through the middle so that the whole thing cooks a little bit more evenly. For the rest of the cake pans, we're going to add some cake strips that we got from the store around the side. These cake strips are soaked in a little bit of water for about a minute or so. The sewed cloth strips goes around every single cake pan besides the smallest one because it doesn't need it. And then after being tied up, we're going to throw these into the oven at 325 degrees until they're fully baked through and a fork comes out clean. The cake strips help prevent excess rising because it cools down the size of the pan while it's cooking and doesn't let the batter on the edges harden too much. You could also do this at home with a wet towel soaked in water, but I'm not sure if that would reach all the way around the cake pan you need. I think for a pink wedding cake that embodies Marie, a nice strawberry raspberry jam would make a lot of sense. She loves pink, those fruits are pink, it adds a nice flavor to the cake and goes along with the frosting that we have planned. So I'm going to take six cups of strawberries that have had their tops removed and just chop them into a bowl. Using a whisk is not the most efficient method I have learned, so I have now switched over to a bench scraper. Chop chop, this is a lot better than the other one. You could also just do these with a knife, but I was trying to find the most efficient way, and in the process definitely found the most inefficient way first. These go straight into a pot with 6 cups of raspberries, who thankfully do not need to be chopped up, and 3 cups of sugar. This gets cooked until it starts to simmer while I add the zest of 2 lemons. Once the jam has reduced by half, I'm taking an immersion blender to this to make this even smoother. This gets cooked down for another 20% or so before being passed through a mesh sieve to remove all those little pesky seeds from the raspberries. This jam is now silky smooth and now goes back into the refrigerator until we're ready to use it again. I think a cream cheese frosting would go really well with this cake, but not just any cream cheese frosting, how about a 
raspberry cream cheese frosting to emphasize that pink cream we got going on. The following amounts are going to be the amount for the whole recipe, but we're going to divide this into three batches. I'm going to first cream together 18 sticks of butter with 24 ounces of cream cheese. Then we're going to dump in 12 pounds of powdered sugar, along with 6 tablespoons of vanilla extract and 6 teaspoons of sea salt. Once the frosting looks like a good consistency, we're going to throw in a couple bags of this freeze-dried raspberry powder. This process is going to get repeated two times more, just to make a mountain after mountain of this beautiful pink frosting. And giving it a little taste, it has a nice acidic taint to it that also complements the cream cheese frosting very well. Usually buttercream is just too much sugar and too much fat that doesn't taste too good and a little cloying, but this actually helps it taste really nice. Once this is done, we can move on to the next step. Now all of our cakes have finished baking and have ample time to cool in the refrigerator just so that they're easily set. We're going to take these out by inverting these onto a rack, peeling off the parchment off the little buds and eating any scraps that come off. And hey, if you accidentally, you know, peel a chunk off the top of your cake and it happens to go on the table, you're legally obligated to eat that. Alvin told you to. You can tell them. Once all of the cakes have had their strips and nails and everything else removed, we're going to go ahead and put this on a cake stand. I like to put a little bit of extra batter or adhesive onto the cake stand before applying a sheet of parchment paper. This helps adhere the parchment paper to the stand and provides a sturdy but slim base for the cakes to be leveled on. With a long serrated knife, I'm usually leveling these by looking at these in eye level and cutting off any of the bumps or cracks that appear along the surface. I'm saving all of the scraps and trimmings that come off of cake. Any that don't make it into my mouth are going into a bowl for a fun little project we're going to do right after this. I'm dividing each cake layer into two. This should hopefully give me enough layers to get the height that I want in the final result. Once all four different radiuses of cakes have been leveled and sliced into their approximate good layers, look at all the cake scraps that we have accumulated. I'm going to take these, put it into a bowl, and crush it up with my hands until I end up with little small chunks. I'm going to spread this evenly on a parchment lined sheet tray and sprinkle these a little bit with salt before putting them into the oven at about 375 until they become toasty. Then, in a small bowl, I'm cracking a couple of eggs, four to be exact, and giving a heavy glug of the rest of this heavy cream container. Honestly, I don't really have the measurements for this. This is the fun part where we do just by feeling. A large lump of brown sugar goes in, followed by a generous dusting of cinnamon. We're going to slowly break these eggs up and mix all of this nice mixture together, and I decided, hey, let's just put more sugar in here for fun, because that's going to taste good. Once this mixture is ready and our cake bits have been toasted, we're going to take our toasted cake bits out of the pan and smooth them into a nice casserole-like dish. This is a cast iron dish that I found in the back, but any sort of 9 by 13 or shallow baking dish would work too. Then this cinnamon, brown sugar, custard, egg, heavy cream mixture is going to go into this cake scraps, and we're going to put this into the fridge until the next day. Then on day 3, we're going to take this out, sprinkle a little bit of brown sugar on top, followed by a little tiny pats of butter. My hope is that once this goes into the oven, the brown sugar and the butter kind of come together to make a nice syrupy, caramel, toffee, crunchy topping. And if you haven't guessed it by now, yes, we are making bread pudding with cake scraps because this stuff tastes good. A heavy pinch of salt to counter a little bit of that sweetness and into an oven at 400 degrees we go for about 30 minutes. Once this comes out, it's smelling pretty good and well, let's just give this a taste because we can't really eat the wedding cake right now. It's still in the fridge. Here's a nice little close-up so you can see some of that crunchy topping that we have created. And let's just take a little spoon out or a very large spoon and look at the interior. Nice and crunchy on the top a nice and moist and custardy on the bottom. And how about a little bit of that jam that we made earlier? It's nice, silky, and smooth, and should provide a pretty good taste when it compared to this bread pudding. Oh yeah, now that's pretty good. Let me go bring this up to the rest of the team while we finish up this wedding cake. It's time to prepare our arsenal of weapons. Our beautiful cooled strawberry raspberry jam is now going into a very large piping bag for later. We're also going to transfer all of this pink frosting into another piping bag. Probably going to need a couple attempts of this one. Next, we're going to do a little bit of arts and crafts here. I have here some cake rounds where cardboard circles cut out to be specifically designed to bottom the cake. I do need to cut a hole in the middle because that's where the cake dowel was going to go. The long sturdy wooden rod that's going to hold up this entire cake. It is now time to assemble our cakes one by one. Again, a little bit of adhesive always helps for this. We're going to start with the smallest layer and work our way bigger. Hmm. This frosting seemed to have gotten a little stiffer than what I remember. Maybe overnight, all that raspberry powder that we put into it absorbed a little more liquid. It is now a little bit tough, and honestly might tear the cake if we spread it too firmly. Let's just make this first layer work, provide a cavity for that nice jam to go sit in, and put the next layer on top. When working through these layers, the frosting was definitely difficult. I could make it work for this little small one, but I'm thinking that it's going to be pretty difficult with the larger pieces of cake that I can't really just shimmy back into shape. So after getting this assembled, we're going to take regretfully all of that frosting that we put into our piping bag and, well, take it out and put it back into the mixer. To thin this is pretty simple. A couple of tablespoons of milk until the consistency is what we want. Just a little test spread on a side piece of cake, and yes, this feels a lot better than the other one. A little bit smoother and definitely can be turned on a turntable. The first step for this part is to make a 
crumb coat. I'm putting enough icing around the sides to be able to spin and smooth this out so that we seal the cake into its nice final shape. I must say, this actually looks pretty good for a crumb coat. It's not super messy, and maybe because our cakes are cold, but this could honestly be the final cake. We're going to repeat this process three more times with the 7 diameter, the 9 diameter, and the 11 inch diameter cakes that we have had. Down goes the cake, on goes a layer of our nice, now softer frosting, pressing a cavity into it to make room for the jam, and then on to the next layer, repeating itself until we get to the final process. A crumb coat of frosting goes on, a couple of spins on the turntable, and we move on to the bigger one. Once all four cakes have been layered, assembled, and crumb coated, these go back into the fridge or the freezer if you have the space so that they can set hard enough for our final outer frosting layer. I've learned that when assembling cakes like this, the fridge, the freezer, and the turntable and a bench scraper are your four best friends, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a best friend, but I'd like to assume that they're all equally loved. Although I definitely think the turntable is my favorite one. Don't tell the others though. Once all the cakes have had about two hours to set in the fridge and the freezer, we're going to take them out and finish off with a nice solid layer of frosting. The frosting needs to be pretty generous because essentially you're shaping any sort of mishaps and slants in the cake to be a nice, smooth, straight line in the edges. So we're going to repeat a similar process as we did for the crumb coating, but we're going to add a lot more frosting to give us a barrier. I like to also make sure that I'm using a lot more frosting than I need because when you're dealing with cold cake, the frosting that touches the frozen or cold cake might stiffen up a little too much. So if you don't use enough, it's going to get a little chunky on you. We're going to do this for all of the layers of the cake, starting with the smallest one and moving all the way to the big boy, and hopefully we end up with enough frosting at the end to finish. It's not so bad for someone who's never made a wedding cake before. Now for the larger cakes, the 9 inch and the 11 inch, I'm going to add in these plastic straws that will act as a secondary layer of support to the cake itself. Sometimes when moving around a wedding cake, the layers can start to slide a little bit. And when you have four of those, well, that's not very good. So we're just going to have to push these straws in, make sure that they're smaller and shorter than the total height of the cake. And remember to take them out when we actually go and eat it, or else that would be a not good surprise. Now, let's make a couple of decorations for the cake. I have here little chocolates from Alrona that we're going to cut into these little chocolate diamonds to assemble on the side of the cake. You just get a little bit of trimming and, well, we have an army of chocolate diamonds ready for work. For the top, there is a top hat that I'm going to go ahead and make out of black fondant. Fondant usually isn't my favorite thing to work with, but in this case, I can't really see myself making fondant from scratch. We're going to make a little top hat here and give them a little bit of personality with two googly eyes made out of sugar. I actually cut the black part off so that it looks a little bit more cartoonish, and I think it looks better this way. Well, I like this. That's a good hat. Next, we have a uh, saw with a dowel because a wooden rod that we got from the store was too big, and well, our cakes are now ready to be impaled in the bottom. We're going to insert the cake slowly through the dowel so that our largest cake can be the base for this. Then we're going to press in that frozen frosting and then go ahead and assemble a little bit more frosting on top to one, cover those straws, and two, provide a base for the next layer of cake to go on. I'm getting a great assistance from Rachel here. And wow, it's going to be a little bit tricky because these cakes are frozen, and yet we still manage to impale and puncture each one. We're going to repeat this process two more times, making sure that the cakes are as center as possible, and also so they get pressed down so there's no big giant holes that are gaping. This was both equally terrifying and entertaining at the same time. And also, the bonus is that because these cakes are frozen, I can actually just use my gloved hands to smooth out any imperfections. We're going to take the cream cheese frosting that we isolated earlier pre-coloring and just pipe little strips. Yeah, this is not looking too great, so with Rachel's help, we're going to transfer this into a bigger bag with a nice shell rose piping tip. Oh yeah, that is a lot better. We're going to repeat this pattern all across the edge of the cake to give it more of a festive vibe that is worth celebrating for. And then, following that, based on the image we have from the video game, we're also going to adorn the sides of this cake with little frosting drapes, curtains if you will, little decorative swoops that you make by going up and down. And for the final touch, some sugar roses that we got online. On top goes a little bouquet and a mini garden of our pink roses with some edible sugar flowers. And then on top goes our little top hat guy with two white eyes. He looks pretty happy, he's just chilling up there. And one last touch is to put our little chocolate diamonds that we made earlier onto one layer of the cake. I think this adds kind of a masquerade, queen of hearts, jack of diamonds kind of feel. The good thing is with this frosting, those suckers just go right in. And I present to you our version of Marie's wedding cake from Persona 5 Tactica. A four layer tiered cake that has a raspberry cream cheese frosting, vanilla cake, and a jam inside. Let's go ahead and give the top a little cross section, shall we? Oh, that looks pretty good. Oh uh, yeah, there's a little chunk there. That is where the 
wooden dowel was. Good thing we didn't eat that. That would have been all stick. Here's a little side view and, well, let's just see how this tastes. I like cold cake for two reasons. It makes the sugar less sweet and it also has a nice chewier texture. But I will say this is actually very delicious. The raspberry in the icing made it so much more tangy and acidic and refreshing. The jam adds a nice element of moistness and the cake is sturdy but still very flavorful. Because it was Kendall's birthday recently, I'm actually going to go ahead and give her the top of this wedding cake. She was also married recently, so let's just say that's my belated gift to her. But since we make sure that this cake does not go to waste, here's a closer look at that cross section. A little bit of a cleaner slice. And this is me dividing up all of the rest of the leftover cake and giving it out to the people in the studio, whether they like it or not. Fun fact, I took home the entire bottom layer, whole. It is still in my freezer to this day. I love cake. This video is sponsored by Atlas. Persona 5 Tactica features an all-new story, the return of the Phantom Thieves, and brand new allies and foes. Join the group as they lead an emotional revolution in this thrilling combat adventure, releasing November 17th, 2023. Persona 5 Tactica is available for pre-order now for Xbox One, Xbox X, and S, PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, Steam, and Nintendo Switch. Check out the link in the description below to learn more.